Well, hey everyone, Pastor Daniel here. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, a gentleman that I uh, went over yesterday in our discipleship hour or Sunday school class with some adults in our church. Uh, a guy who was a hymn writer and a poet and did ministry alongside another famous hymn writer and pastor by the name of John Newton. And this gentleman is, his name is William Cooper. And when I was in seminary and I wrote a paper on this guy, because I had to pick someone in church history to write a paper on for a, for a leadership class, I think it was. And um, I was like, I'll look at this William Cowper guy, because his last name is spelled C-O-W-P-E-R, but it's not spelled Cowper. Uh, phonics does not work for his last name. It's pronounced Cooper. Um so William Cooper, and he wrote a lot of hymns that are in our hymnals today. Um, probably the most famous one is There is a Fountain Filled with Blood Drawn from Emmanuel's Veins, and Sinners uh, Plunge Beneath That Flood Lose All Their Guilty Stains. That's a great hymn. I love using that for communion as a hymn. Uh, he also wrote some other book. Uh, oh, actually, probably another famous one, just as famous as God Moves in a Mysterious Way. And this is the hymn that I went over yesterday with uh, people in my flock. Uh, it's just a beautiful piece of poetry. Um, I'll read some of the li lyrics later. And some other ones are um, Love Constraining to Obedience. Another really good one that's re been redone to a better tune is called Heal Us Emmanuel. And my own denomination, the PCA, has redone a lot of these hymns to better tunes, and they're just really good. Um, so, William Cooper. Who was William Cooper? So, this guy was born in 1731, and he would die in 1800, so he lived a pretty good long life, um, pretty decent life, I guess, that time period. And uh, he was one of seven children that were born to his mom and dad, but uh, only he and his younger brother, John, were the only survivors of their uh, the seven children, so he just only had a younger brother. Could have had more, obviously. But then his mother died uh, when he was only six years old. So 1737 is when she would pass away. Um, and that really, something that they, they say he never really fully recovered from. Uh, he was not very close with his stepmother. Uh, he would actually be educated with a classical education, classical kind of old school liberal uh, education. And so, even though his, his father and family wanted him to do the, the family tradition of going into the law, um, he didn't feel very suited for the law. He loved his classical education, loved poetry, um, would become a really good poet later in his life. Um, so, he does pass, he's called to the bar and can practice law when he's like, you know, 24, 25, but he just doesn't devote much time to the subject. He'd rather just do the classical literature stuff. Um, he actually would do this translation project of the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer's famous works there. Would finally complete his translation of those works by 1790 when he's about 60 years old. But he would devote himself a lot to poetry um, for the rest of his life. Uh, but here's the main part of his biography is that he was definitely someone you would... Um, diagnosed as having melancholy and if he was alive today people may say he has chronic depression or something like that and maybe would need some special medical attention uh his depression really affected his his entire adult life he never recovers from this depression and and just his spirituality affects it too um here's a lot of things he struggled with he he doubted whether he was truly elect he believed all the doctrines about god and he prayed to God and seemed to love God, but he just wondered if God had it out for him. He wondered if he had committed the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and he wasn't sure what that actually meant, but he thought, I probably committed this. This is why God maybe doesn't love me like as he should. Um, he's always said that there's, he said that God had a special providence, a direct providence for him, for Cooper. Um, so it wasn't that he read something in the Bible that disturbed him. It was just he felt disturbed in his soul and that God had it out for him as a sinner. Um, it, this really goes back to this notion that sometimes many Christians can even feel, even non-Christians can feel, that that the sin in their own hearts is a bigger deal than the grace that's in the heart of Jesus. Even though 
the, the Jesus' grace and the love in his heart is bigger than the sin in our hearts. Uh, that's what the truth is. But Cooper had a lot of trouble believing that. Um, struggled with a lot of depression, had a crisis after, what crisis after the crisis. He would attempt to commit suicide a few different times in his, throughout his life and always failed, obviously. Um, so and he always wondered, did his depression come from God or come from Satan? Um, just a very sad life in terms of his depression and how it affects him trying to commit suicide. Um, some other things that would happen is that, uh, let's see, I'm looking at some of my notes here from my paper uh, years ago. You know, he would focus on the atonement a lot. And you see that in his hymn, uh, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. The atonement is a pretty amazing doctrine for him. In fact, this is really cool. Um, his younger brother, John, who was also a pastor, um, I think uh, Cooper, William Cooper, he thought of going into the ministry for a while, but determined it was not for him. But his brother, John, would. But John was not an evangelical. Um, he was more liberal in his beliefs, I guess. Um, and unlike William and also his friend John Newton, who were both um, uh, evangelical Calvinists in Britain during that time. Uh, so one thing that William did when John was on his deathbed, his younger brother was on, a de was on his deathbed, William would go to him and he tried to convince him of the scriptural and evangelical doctrine of the atonement, that Jesus' death is sufficient, that he was our substitute for our sin. And he persuaded of his younger brother that the atonement that the Bible talks about is true. And so he converted his younger brother on his deathbed. He his brother was a minister. Um, so the atonement was a big deal, a significant doctrine uh, for Cooper. Um, eventually he would go to London and then uh, eventually goes to Olney. And that's where he bumps next to... Uh, John Newton, and they become really good friends. Um, they would do ministry together, and um, they would promote kind of British evangelical Calvinism in their day, uh, which is pretty significant. Um, they would write a hymnal together. Uh, That's where we get a lot of Newton's hymns and Cooper's hymns. You know, but if you look at um, their relationship, uh, Newton is frustrated with Cooper because of Cooper's depression and Cooper's lack of assurance. And Newton's wondering, you know, hey, Cooper, how come you can write these beautiful lyrics about the gospel to not only believe that they apply to you? And sometimes uh, Newton can be a little harsh with Cooper. And some historians wonder if uh, Newton was a little too harsh and that made Cooper a little more depressed. And that's you know, kind of interesting to dig into. Um, I read, I've read some of the letters that Newton wrote to Cooper, and sometimes he could be a little stern, but you can tell he loved Cooper and prayed for Cooper and wanted what was best for him, for his friend. Um, but they wrote their this hymnal together. Um, it's it's pretty obvious that Cooper was beneficial to Newton because Newton could write really good lyrics, but um, he wasn't as much of a poet as Cooper was. So Cooper would probably refine and help Newton uh, with some of the lyrics of some of those, his most famous hymns that we sing today. Um, he wrote a lot of poems throughout his life too. So he's writing both hymns and poems. Um, but really his hymns show a lot of his gospel and evangelical faith. Um, but he would still struggle throughout the rest of his life until he dies in, uh, 1800. Um, again, depression, trying to commit suicide. Um, he just never, it just never relented. It just never went away. Um, and one part of that affected him is that he wanted to be married. He was engaged, uh, briefly, but, um, the engagement, um, uh, you know, failed. And so he's, I think he said that he was, he wanted to love and to be loved, but he never really got to experience that because he never was married and had kids. Um, so that's his life. That's a, just a brief summary. Um, oh, this is kind of cool, too. Um, a final poem that he wrote called The Castaway. And this poem focused on the image of a sailor being tossed about on the sea. And the sailor is washed overboard as his shipmates are, are unable to rescue him. However, the ship seemingly goes to its happy intended destination while the poor sailor wallows as a poor wretch to a certain fate. So Cooper sees himself as the sailor. 
who's drowning and cannot be saved. You know, all of his friends, like Newton and others, want to come out and save and help uh, Cooper. Um, they can't do that. They go on to their happy destination, which I guess in his mind is heaven or salvation. And Cooper uh, just drowns away, drowned in sin, his own sin and damnation. So this is one of his final poems, and this is kind of where he felt he was at was with his lack of assurance. Um, and he would pass finally on April 25th, 1800, in a peaceful sleep. All right, it's kind of a depressing story, because you think, oh, where's the happy ending going to come? But uh, there is no happy ending, at least in his earthly life. Uh, but still, I think there's lots, there's lots of encouragement from all this. Um, for, it, it just shows that no Christian has all together. And then there are some Christians who just struggle and they just struggle for a long time. And some Christians may struggle throughout their entire life with a thorn in the flesh or some besetting sin or some uh, doubt or insecurity, a lack of assurance. Um, actually, our Westminster Confession of Faith says that there are just times when Christians may not feel assurance and acknowledges that that's going to be the case, but um, the Lord can bring assurance back. But sometimes we just don't always feel assurance. We don't feel the Lord's presence near us, but does not neglect that we are elect, that we are in Christ still. Um, just Cooper's struggle with depression, we can realize that um, these are dangerous waters to wallow in, but um, the Lord still used someone like Cooper to do gospel ministry. I mean, we are ministered to in the gospel by Cooper's hymns 250 years later after he wrote them, which is pretty amazing. Even though the guy, this guy struggled in this in this way, um, we can we can still benefit from his ministry, and that was the Lord's goodness uh, in Cooper's life. Um, I think the thing we can learn is just how to love people for the long haul. You know, probably John Newton needed to have more patience as a pastor, which convicts me as a pastor. Like I need to have patience with certain people, uh, even difficult people. I'm sure Newt Cooper was difficult to deal with, um, but. The kind of um, sometimes you need tough love, but sometimes you need a lot of grace and patience. And um, some maybe you think that you're kind of like a Cooper, or you know a Cooper in your life. Um, so we can learn a lot from his life story. We just read a few of the um, lyrics from some of his hymns. Um, the chorus to the hymn uh, "Heal Us, Emmanuel," which has a really good tune rewritten for it by um, by the Indelible Grace folks. The chorus goes, "Heal us, Emmanuel." Here we stand, waiting to feel thy touch. To deep wounded souls reach forth, thy hand, O Savior, we are such. Uh, and then another hymn, uh, Love Constraining to Obedience. Um, the first, uh, actually the second stanza starts like this. How long beneath the law I lay, in bondage and distress. I toiled the precepts to obey, but toiled without success. And then the chorus goes, To see the law by Christ fulfilled, to hear his pardoning voice, changes a slave into a child, and duty into choice. Um, so a lot of you know the, the, the hymn, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. Um, so you can look that up on your own. But I love the hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. Um, let me just read you two of these stanzas, which are really significant, I think. Uh, second stanza, ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break with blessings on your head. Uh, actually, I'll do three. Let me, let me read the third stanza here. I'll do the fourth one. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Um, just the mystery of God's providence and affliction. Why does God bring affliction to us? And the answer is we don't know. And Cooper acknowledges we just don't know. But even if you think that God's providence is a frown, it's really God's smile through the frown. And uh, um, the Puritan John Flavel said that we should not think that we are wiser than God's providence. Because if we knew what God knew, then we would probably enact that providence just like God does, if we knew what God knew. Um, let's not think that we are wiser than God's providence. Let's not also 
uh, take a life event and make that just one shred of the tapestry of God's providence. It's not look at God's providence through the individual shreds, but it's it's one beautiful large tapestry that tells God's story of redemption in your life and the life of the the cosmos itself. Um, so those perspectives on God's providence, even in affliction, are helpful. So I hope you've enjoyed um, the story of Cooper. Hope your churches or whatever ministry you're part of will sing these songs by Cooper. And hopefully as you, as you sing these lyrics um, and you know the story of Cooper, you know the man who wrote these lyrics, even as he struggled to believe in these lyrics, um, that should be encouraging to us that it's okay that we can struggle to believe these words, but we can still sing these words and press them into our hearts so that we can hopefully believe them more fully someday. All right, that's William Cooper. Have a good week and God bless.